I want to take a brief moment to share just a little background about the wonderful work of our safety net enhancement grantees. That's the name of the, the group and the cluster of work that we launched about four years ago. The Kresge Foundation funded this effort to really explore population-based approaches and models to reduce health inequities in vulnerable communities. Clearly, we were really looking for impacts and strategies that could address some of the social and environmental conditions that impact health. Your panel today includes four of the eight communities that we funded, and these are communities from all over the country. But we had a very strong commitment when we started this initiative. We had three major goals. One, we wanted to support communities in their efforts to address some of the social and environmental conditions that impacted health and had persisted in impacting health in their communities. Secondly, we wanted to foster multi-sector partnerships because as we know, that's an important way to get the work done. But further, we wanted to engage communities, local communities, in prioritizing and making decisions about how they can address those health conditions. And then third, we were hoping that we could develop some new models and new ways of thinking, new ways of behaving across sectors and through partnerships that could improve health or place communities on the pathway to health. Each of the groups of partners that you are going to hear from today had identified the communities where they wanted to work in. They had identified the target populations who they wanted to serve. They were responsible for identifying the core partners with whom they would work, and they had the tough challenge of identifying one health disparity that they wanted to work on. And we are so excited to have Spencer Michaels as your moderator. Uh, Spencer is a health journalist for PBS's NewsHour. He is a graduate of Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and holds a master's from Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. His work has taken him to Israel, to Vietnam, to European cities and other places around the world. And I'll step aside and let him introduce the panelists and guide us through this conversation that we want to have with you this morning. Spencer. As a news person, my job is to demystify programs and goals and language, avoid lingo and abbreviations, and try to explain and talk about these things so we're all on the same page. That said, we really want to figure out how these community health partnerships work or don't work and what we can learn. Kresge has sponsored, as Phyllis says, eight sites. We're going to focus on four of them today. What should be the role of the community health center in addressing health disparities? How important is leadership? How do you get the community involved? And how can multi-sector partnerships work? Who are valuable partners and who are not? And we're talking about partners. We're talking about community agencies and governments and health centers and so forth that work with the program. So a quick introduction. Amanda Guy directs community health programs in Flagstaff, Arizona. Dana Harvey is from Alameda County, California where she's executive director of Mandela Marketplace and Food to Families. Crystal Palmer runs wellness initiatives in Roxbury, part of Boston. And Lucille Smith is executive director of Voices of Detroit Initiative. So Amanda Guy from Flagstaff, Arizona, is director of community health programs and services of North County Healthcare. The project is called Hermosa Vida. Near one elementary school with a largely Native American and Hispanic student body in Flagstaff, parents were afraid to let their kids out of the dwellings. The park nearby was overrun by drunks and derelicts. Arizona had passed a controversial law, SB 1070, which allowed law enforcement to ask people with brown skin for their papers. The immigration service was in the neighborhood. The story went, <clears throat> so keep the kids inside. That and other problems led to an amazing lack of physical activity by everybody. Amanda Guy had plenty to do. 29 different partners, almost, 
That seems like a lot to deal with. How did you do it? So something that Kresge did that was just incredible was they provided us a nine-month planning period. And during the nine-month planning period, we were able to do community-engaged research and really engage community members in what the health disparity was, identifying the health disparity, investigating it, and then determining the strategies we would put in place to try to address it. And so some of those partners from the get-go um, were, for instance, the um, healthy kids, fit kids from the local hospital, um, some very natural partners like the county health department and the local parks and rec departments, but some unlikely partners started to emerge and those partners included the local uh, food security because when you're talking about food abundance, oftentimes there's food insecurity considerations as well. And so we really ended up getting some in unlikely and incredible partners along the way. It was the community at large and engaging and talking about everything from food to physical activity and the immigration status. But it must be a little bit tricky, you would think, dealing with a bunch of partners, some of whom probably are pretty good and you get along with, and some of whom are not. How do you n negotiate and navigate through the, through the nervousness of, of telling some partner, you know, maybe you're not right for us. The people that came together around this particular initiative all had a place in their hearts for making this work. And um, I think one of the best things about it was that we had a steering committee from the get-go that was involved in the planning phase, was involved in the community engagement, heard the community say what they wanted to have happen, and then um, from there on out, the, the steering committee is what we called it, continued to meet and were very transparent about um, who the dedicated staff were, how much money was available, and how to um, engage in different scopes of work, what, co what community organization would do this part of the scope of work. And because there was, it was a very complex project with lots of moving parts, uh, different community organizations took the lead on different strategies, and it worked for us. So did you have to drop some potential partners along the way? I would say that over time, it really ended up picking up additional partners. And coordinating 29 partners, that, that sounds tricky. Well, not everybody was in the steering committee. There were other offshoots. So, that, for instance, the school-based strategies ended up having partners that met just for the school-based strategies, and then there was a policy coalition. The policy coalition ended up having partners that were focused on policy change, uh, focused on making sure that alcohol and 40 ounces weren't sold near the parks and that sort of thing. And so there were you know, different entities that were really focused and working on different strategies and different movements. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Dana Harvey, who's sitting next, runs a program in Alameda County, California, that's essentially Oakland, called Foods for Fam Food for Families. And she's also the guiding light of Mandela Marketplace, a community produce stand. The neighborhood is a food desert. It's nearly 100% African American. Getting folks to take part and stay in the program was difficult, though there did seem to be demand for information and help with stress, parenting, breastfeeding, and food. Classes were begun in conjunction with the West Oakland Health Center. Coupons for health food, actually food prescriptions, were initiated, though the county didn't participate in the effort and farmers markets were excluded. A $60 a month incentive was offered to those taking part. Dana told me that 10 people, 10 women, stayed with the program for two years, which I want to ask about, because it doesn't sound like a huge number. Dana told me that the bureaucracy in the area often got in the way of implementing the program. Seventy organizations were involved, but there were, there were classes in parenting, uh, meditation, massage, but there were bumps along the way, and the cooperation sometimes faltered. Dana can explain that. Mandela Marketplace, uh, we are a nonprofit organization, and we really work in this nexus of community health and economic development uh, which is a challenging spot, but what I think we um, see and that aligns a lot with public health is that to address issues of public health, you've really got to get to the economy of people, and addressing the issues of poverty is really important. So um, I'm just going to put that out in the beginning. 
Um, and then what Kresge did that was so innovative, especially for a foundation, and what the public health department did that was so innovative in the beginning, was they also had a nine month planning period and the public health department created the building blocks collaborative. And that's where the 70 partners sort of came together through the building blocks collaborative. When it came time then to actually tease out a project from this amazing collection of different organizations and agencies and community residents who were also part of this collaborative, um, we looked at all, of, you know, everyone talked about, well, we have to find out what the needs are. So we decided that there had already been a lot of data collected and let's look at what rose to the top. So what rose to the top was jobs and food. So our organization was a natural fit for moving a project forward. Um, so in moving the project forward, we really wanted to hold that initial value of having multiple partners involved. Um, so we designed this idea of working with the health clinic and working with our nonprofit to have the food prescriptions and food access at our retail sites. Um, and Would you look, explain what a food prescription is? That's yes. an interesting so concept. Yes, so the health clinic that we worked with is in West Oakland, and the nutritionists or the nurses, when they saw clients, they would say, okay, I'm prescribing to you that you need to eat more kale and more yellow vegetables. And then we had a little coupon that the, the women would get, and it would have a list of the different um, foods that the nurse prescribed for them. They would bring that coupon to one of our retail sites, either corner stores, produce stands, or the food cooperative. Um, and then they could, they could buy those vegetables and fruits at the store, and then check off on their little prescription, I bought eggplant and kale and oranges, and then at the next class, which we held weekly, the women could um, bring their coupon and sort of check in. You think it worked? I think that it needed a little more time. Wholesome Wave in Connecticut had great success with this idea of prescriptions and coupons. And I hope that we can sort of continue this so that we can see what we really wanted was to see a shift in the BMI of the women. But we didn't really quite have long enough to see that shift. OK. Well, yes, I think it worked. We'll get more into that. Your original yeah. comment that we had to address problems of poverty yes. is intriguing because I think that's what this is all about. Let's uh, talk to Crystal Palmer for a minute. She's the director of wellness initi initiatives, Whittier Health Street Center in Roxbury, which is one of 17, one sec of 17, neighborhoods. 17 neighborhoods in Boston. Its goal is to build vibrant communities in public housing. Many people in the community were skeptical and reluctant to get into the programs to address the high rates of hypertension and depression among the largely African American and Hispanic residents in Boston public housing. Crystal told me on the phone when we talked about this at first, we struggled and still struggle every day to recruit people. It's a constant battle. Often she heard people say, you people come in here with programs all the time, and then you leave and nothing has changed. And I'm sure you've all heard that before. One approach that helped was hiring residents of the housing projects, people familiar with the culture and the language. The programs the Kresge grant supported including nutrition, included nutrition classes, exercise, <laughs> life coaching, <laughs> computer classes, and job referrals. One of the most successful approaches was a summer camp for kids. Crystal says that when the program officially ended, having exceeded its goals, there was significant improvement in weight, stress, anxiety, depression among those who took part. But the big question remaining is how to get more folks involved. So why don't you tell us how you can try to get more folks involved, Crystal? Woody Street Health Center is an urban health center in a community of about 60,000 people. Maybe you put that mic a little closer. 60,000 people in Massachusetts. Um, Whittier Street has been providing over the last 80 years primary, primary care services in the housing developments. 81% of our patients are housing, uh, live in housing developments. 
70% of them present with at least one chronic disease. 80% of them present with psychosocial issues. So we've been providing primary care services um, for a long time, primarily doing, besides primary care, um, doing health screenings and things of that sort. But the Cresby grant afforded us an opportunity to sort of look behind the scenes to see um, the root causes of some of these um, clinical situations that we've been um, addressing over the years. So we designed a program called Building Vibrant Communities. And the model was to use residents in those communities who are familiar with the culture and language of the people to engage the residents and connect them to care, help them to navigate the system. So we have been pretty successful in doing so despite the ups and downs and the daily struggle to get people involved. There's a sustained interest in the program um, from those who have participated over the years and an expanding interest in the program. I've had recently a woman from about a mile away heard about the program and she walked to my office, gave me her BMI information and said she wanted to participate in the program. One of the key uh, factors in having the residents come to the program is transportation. And simple changes like changing the driver for the program could upset people and prevent them from wanting to participate. But we have to continue to work with them. Do you have contact with people with the power structure in the area, with, the, with say, the mayor or with the city council? How do you navigate that? Well, our primary partner in this program is the Boston Health Authority. So those are the people that we, we keep um, engagement with, the um, building managers, uh, the leader at the uh, city hall. Those are the people that we stay engaged with. But basically, the key are these residents who reside in the developments. Those, are, those people are key to bringing the, the residents to the program. OK. So we'll get back to that in a little while. Let me introduce Lucille Smith who's the executive director of Voices of Detroit Initiative, otherwise known as VODI, program designed to help treat diabetes and hypertension on Detroit's northeast side. Like many low-income areas, Detroit's east side is a food desert. You can't find a supermarket nearby where you can get healthy vegetables and other foods at reasonable prices. It's difficult for seniors and others to walk to a grocery store or even to a health clinic. So how do they access the health services that do exist? The program has 600 members, and one goal has been to empower those people to talk with doctors and dispel many myths about health. Despite the Affordable Care Act, there are still a lot of people who are uninsured. Vody is trying to make it easier to enroll. Vody is working, like all these groups, with a group of partners. The Kresge program is ongoing and with many of the activities done by other organizations. And Lucille can help us understand how this complex system is organized. Vody is um, a 15-year-old coalition. Uh, our partners are health systems uh, and uh, community health centers, uh, along with the health department and Wayne State and um, University School of Medicine. So, uh, and we've had great success with the University of Michigan um, School of Pharmacy. Uh, so it was a multi-partner, uh, intersectoral uh, partnership that we had, and we had a great deal of experience with that. So partnerships, relationships have been extremely important in getting things done. And for the community had, um, and providers felt comfortable with Vody holding data related to information about claims, about what kind of services, diagnosis, people were using who were uninsured, because that is what we were originally um, brought into being for, is to uh, provide care to people who were uninsured uh, and did not have access to care. 
Can you be a little bit more specific about your relationship with the clinic itself? I mean, how do you interact with those folks? Those, the, all of the clinics, all of the community um, health centers are members of VOTI, a part of VOTI's coalition, uh, have been for, um, we are 15, 16 years old, and about 14 of those years, they have been full partners with us. And they provide the primary care. Health systems did not feel that they could provide primary care because they couldn't get paid for it. Um, health centers could get paid for it, so the, the division took place in which the health centers provided the primary care and the hospitals provided the ancillary specialty services by partnering with each of the health centers so that there was a continuum of care. Then we ran into a major problem with prescriptions. Um, you can provide care to folks, but if they can't get their medications and the rest, so the city health department at one time had a pharmacy and we provided uh, support. We found some financial support for them to get their pharmacy to function more appropriately uh, and provide um, prescriptions for uninsured so, people. So as a lay person looking at this, I'm thinking to myself, here's a pharmacy, here's a health clinic, all set up, been going for a while. A Kresge program comes in and tries to involve itself in all this. One would think there would be jealousies and rivalries. What are you doing in here trying to tell us how to run our show? Does that happen? Not over uninsured people. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. There might be a fight to get rid of them, but not, never a fight to <laughs> provide services. So that's the, the most difficult part, is finding the incentives for people to work together. But we targeted a, uh, two zip codes uh, in the northeast part of Detroit. So we didn't try to um, do this um, project and just over, over the entire city. Uh, and it has been ex what we consider to be um, successful. We developed a hub, a centralized campus where people could come and safety became our determinant of health uh, because safety was important as a part of getting access to health care, but also in being able to be more physically fit, more involved in um, nutrition and everything. Safety was a very important part of it. So let's open it up now to, to sort of general discussion. And I think where we just left off was a good place to start. The relationship with the other agencies in the community, the police department, the public health department, the schools, the housing authority, et cetera, et cetera. How do you get into a community and become part of that without antagonizing the, the power structure that already exists? Uh, any, I don't know, uh, Amanda, you wanna deal with that? Well, in our case, um, once again, going back to the planning phase, it, um, I think that what really set us on the right course is that we did um, a process that is called RARE, which is Rapid Assessment Research and Evaluation in a community to look specifically um, in a very short amount of time what the community was interested in addressing and why and how we could address it. And then um, after we had the results and engaged local ethnographers in the work, then we went back to the community to ask them um, to vote on strategies, and they actually got to vote in a community meeting on the strategies we would put in place if we were to receive the demonstration funding from the Kresge Foundation. And so um, I think from the get-go, all of the original partners were really engaged in talking with the community about what they'd like to see. And as a result, everyone was on the same page from the beginning because the community is the one that indicated what strategies they would like to put in place and how it would play out. In, so, in Oakland. Can I, yeah, to, yeah so what, just to follow up with I that. I wanted you to follow up because the, the, <laughs> the, the situation in Oakland, I happen to know that some of the yeah. politics there yeah. is a very political city. Yes, it is. And, and how do you get in there and, and make yourself known? So I think there were a couple of levels of um, partnership that were interesting. One is that I have a very close relationship with a senior staff at Alameda County Public Health. 
and we've been working together for a long time. So having that close link and a working relationship between a community-based organization and the health department, I think is key. So that we're working really together. The second level is, um, as Amanda's experience was, we're a community-based organization that focuses on empowering people in the community, engaging them in identifying what the problems are and what the solutions are, and then resourcing them to implement those solutions. So I think those two levels of you know, really personal relationships was very important for us. And we did um, the community engagement about what the issues were, but then we had focus groups and asked the, so our program targeted pregnant women at the West Oakland Health Center and we asked them, what do you need for your families? And they listed a lot of other things besides food. It was stress management and food access and parenting classes and other um, um, problems that we were then able to help them address. Did you have to go higher, though? Did you have to get the city council or somebody to, to get involved in this, or was there enough going on at the lower level that, that, that it would work? So from my vantage point, you can't get any higher than the community residents that were targeted to serve. That's as high as you can go. Um, so for us, we were there. But you did I, try to see the mayor at one point. That wasn't for this project. That was for, I, I, I'm happy to tell anyone about that <laughs> later. <laughs> and our experience, that was around the food co-op uh, business oh, I see. venture. But for this project, I think um, the important piece was that Kresge wanted to say, if we put a health center in the center and then look at all of the community resources that are addressing health issues and somehow weave them together to create a healthier environment, then can we shift the issues of poor health? that isn't just about prescriptions or seeing your doctor, but it's about all of these other um, challenges that we're talking about. So I think holding that as our goal was the important piece. Um, so, and the funding, how, I mean, I got, I got us, the funding made the difference. If we yeah. didn't have the money, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So I think having the innovative um, foundation to come in and tell the county we want this funded, and the, county may, and the county may not have funded it in the same way. So I think that was really important, too. Um, so. Crystal, Boston is famous for its politics, its ward <laughs> politics. You know, you, you got really to know somebody. You don't look Irish. <laughs> and so how do, you, how do you deal with the power structure? Or do you need to? Well, I agree with Dana. We sort of handled it um, with, at the community level. If, um, when the program was piloted, it was really difficult for us to engage adults, because during the community needs assessment, the adults um, reported that there was just too much going on in their lives. So um, the program was piloted somewhere in June, and the way we got to um, really begin the program was to engage the youth. And that was a great help to the parents who felt that there was just too much going on um, with all the issues of violence and, and such. And so we began a camp with about 150 youth where we did football conditioning. Uh, the kids were taken to all the cultural places in Boston, a lot of swimming activities and things like that. So we engaged those uh, children, I think it was five to 13, for over the last four years. We did have a camp again this past summer. So that's how we sort of handled the potential for violence in the developments. And um, by having the adults also participate in the wellness program, the exercise programs and things like that, some of them um, stated that um, they no longer feel that their neighbors are their enemies, simply because they're participating in this wellness program that we designed um, 
that with the components of exercise, nutrition, and stress management. So we have engaged over 600 residents and a th over 1,000 altogether with various activities. But in this wellness program where they have the exercise, nutrition, and stress management, we engage about 600 residents. And so many of them stated that for the first time, they're able to come out of their apartments and feel comfortable because they're now part of a family. They no longer fear their neighbors and things like that. Could you well, do more or the, what? The program was designed to engage a third of the residents. There were 1,800 families. And we engaged over the last number I saw was 1224. But in this particular wellness exercise group, we maintained about 600 residents participating in these uh, exercise programs. Lucille, are you reaching enough people in, in Detroit? Well, we're reaching more than we had anticipated. Um, it took us a while to get there. Um, we've, um, they have built, like uh, Crystal said, a network. Um, they depend on each other. Um, people who never communicated with each other, next door neighbors, are now, they have a safe place to come. They have a safe place to be able to talk with each other. And about um, October 22nd, we had a community um, partner breakfast, and they built their own skit. Uh, and well, what's the safe place you talked about? Is it a physical spot? It's a physical spot. It's a campus where uh, a old hospital that is closed um, was on, and uh, it's owned by St. John, um, St. John Providence Health System, and they're one of our partners. Um, they provide the space for us um, there, and that's where the people come. They provide the safety, and the community has a um, they have a group of volunteers who go out and they patrol the streets during school hours and also when we have campus events. Uh, there are two senior citizen complexes there. So it's a hub concept. Uh, we call it Impact Our Healthy Living Campus. Um, and the, in the skit they showed exactly what they do. They go out and they recruit other people. Uh, they tell their friends about it. Their friends come, and once they see what's going on, because one of the things they told us in the beginning was that um, they wanted to, uh, they did not trust their providers. Uh, we were really surprised, but they really felt that um, they didn't trust what they said. They had a lot of home remedies and cultural differences. You're talking about health providers? I'm talking about doctors. Doctors. <laughs> doctors, nurses. <laughs> that, that's, they didn't trust them. And so um, they didn't trust the information that they got. Uh, they didn't feel like they understood them. Uh, and they didn't get a chance to talk with them a lot. So by involvement with the university and students from the university, uh, and trying to teach, um, it accomplished two things. They were able to teach students how they should be, uh, deal with communities and work in communities, but it also gave an opportunity for um, us to empower uh, our residents in terms of what they needed to ask, give them the comp be to become comfortable with saying, I don't understand what you're saying to me. Uh, this medication is giving me problems. Um, so, you know, we did uh, medication assessments with them. Uh, we gave them a health card, so whenever they went to the doctor, they had a card, their questions on it, and the doctor was to put in their blood pressure reading and their um, uh, blood sugar readings, uh, or the A1C if they've taken that. And so we worked with both the providers and with the uh, residents to get them comfortable with each other and in the process, uh, one of the things that the providers told us is that it made them better because they began to understand what it is that the people they were treating needed. Interesting. That's that's interesting story. This is a challenge um, sometimes in our work as a nonprofit organization is that um, we really, we're trying to look at generational change. 
So what we want to do is dig deeper with maybe fewer people, but make a real change because what we see is, and this was the interesting thing of working with mothers or pregnant women, if we make a change in the mom, it's going to change her child, which is going to change their child. And so the numbers might not be today. We might not do 100. And our numbers were smaller than we would have liked. And I think that's one of the issues I brought up about bureaucracy getting in the way in that you know, the, it takes a while for an institution to change. So for the health clinic to enroll women in the program and monitor them and keep them incentivized to participate, you know, it was a new approach for them. And they had to work out a lot of the kinks to make a change. And so they're still working on it. And I know they'll get there. They're still committed to it. But it just took a little longer. But the depth of the change, I think, is something that we don't always consider. So That's a good point. Is there anything you've seen or heard, any of you, today that sound like it's something that you hadn't heard before or that you could use in any of your programs? I think that, um, you know, continuing with the idea of how do we on the ground continue to chip away at our health institutions and forming better relationships is, um, sounds like it's, it's a recipe for success. And I think that that's something that, you know, from just hearing the other stories and how that works, that's something that we're going to keep working on. And that's the sustainability of the work that we started. We're going to keep on uh, making it happen. I'm somewhat impressed by some of your stories that seem to indicate that this is really pr working pretty well in a lot of cases, even though you've all expressed certain frustrations along the way. But is it working well? Are you making a dent? I mean, w one of you started out by saying, well, we really have to address the problems of poverty, which you know we could spend four days here on and not touch. But are, are we making a dent? Well, um, at least in Boston, um, I just learned that um, BU and the American Heart Association are launching a program that's similar to the Kresge um, program, even within some of the same developments that um, that our cross that um, where we launched our Kresge project. And within the health center, we do have a lot of initiatives, hypertension and other initiatives. And what I notice is that the hypertension classes occur around the same time that we have our aerobics classes. So they sort of set up their program around the same time that we are having our program so that our, you know, we. The, client, the uh, residents are sort of participating in both programs now. So they, go, they attend the hypertension classes where they got a, a lot of um, information about cardiovascular diseases and such. And then they go over to our exercise program. So it's sort of spreading, um, you know, increasing awareness and you know, spreading the uh, types of programs within the community, so. I think um, we are making a dent because our residents and our members tell us that we're making a dent. When they put together their own skit and without any professional help and showed us how they felt we were doing, they told us that, hey, look, we, en we enjoy this. We're bringing in other people to the program because we think that we need to change our lifestyle so that we can be healthier. They're um, adapting the exercises to what they can do. Um, they're in the gardening programs. And they're integrating all of that together. Uh, and one of the things that we learned from them is that um, it was difficult to get people to come to continuous group classes a health education group classes. So what we did is integrate a health message into other activities. So it was short, it was brief, and it, it was like a, um, a, a um, 
Jeopardy game that uh, you could put in for five minutes and then they could go on to their exercise or, or into their cooking class and where they were learning things. So, uh, and they remembered what they learned. Uh, it was interesting to them. But to just do a class, we were having not too great of a success. We haven't talked very much except very peripherally about safety and concerns over violence. How do you deal with that and how do you deal with the police or the sheriff or who is ever in charge of that? And does it make a difference? Can you have an impact? So uh, safety has been an underlying aspect to this particular project because of, um, as Spencer mentioned, SB 1070 was coming into play right when we were doing our kind of intense community engagement effort. And what we were finding was, as he kind of alluded to, that people really just couldn't engage on a health idea when safety and their family, getting making sure that all their family members returned to home in the evening was the biggest thing that they could possibly um, think about and, and really make sure it happened. And so that was one component. And then as um, another component was really looking at recreation amenities and recreation and physical activity in communities. And some of the things that we found were that the BMX um, park that was put there um, was used for other social activity. <laughs> um, and then he also mentioned the tennis court, which was a city um, built structure and recreational amenity. And what we found was that what people were primarily using it for was for a beer garden during the Cinco de Mayo festival instead of um, what it was supposed to be used for. And so a lot of our research was looking into what were recreation amenities? How could we make them safer? How could we make them a default place to recreate and be together and to build community? Um, and so, so much of our work was working on developing policy and um, now you have to have a permit to have an open container in the park. And so that d did allow for um, police departments to move intoxicants along um, if they couldn't demonstrate that they had a permit. But yet at the same time, it still allowed for um, fiestas and, and weddings to happen in the community parks. And, um, and so, so much of the work was just uh, working with the community to find out what were the things that would make it safer for you? What would make it so that you would be willing to send your kids there and not worry um, and not have just screen time in the afternoons, but have a chance to play in a park in your community and engage in your community the way you were supposed to? Interesting. Okay, well, why don't we take a few questions from the audience in the time we have left? We had an internal evaluator for the Hermosa Viva project, and the internal evaluator developed something called the ripple effect tool, which was kind of an interesting way to look at connectivity and to look at the impact that this particular project had on the community as a whole. And so we looked at um, how many grants were received as a result of partnerships that were developed, how many relationships um, came out of this, how many um, you know, papers were written, all, all this sort of thing. And so she was really able to demonstrate that this small project just a absolutely ballooned into an, an, an enormous impact on a smaller community. In our project, there's a couple ways that we've sustained the work. Um, one is on a personal level with the women that, we, um, that were in our program. So sort of there's one woman who sort of personifies the success of this. So she started in the program. She came to every class we had. She um, redeemed every coupon she got. She paid attention to what the doctors told her in terms of eating healthier. She was very overweight when she started and she was pregnant. Now she um, stayed with, so at the end of our program, we also gave a, a core group of moms um, an intensive nutrition education class so they could become peer <coughs> nutrition educators. So she's really embraced that and now she teaches weekly peer nutrition classes at the West Oakland Health Center. She's lost weight, she brings her children with her. So I think that working with her, you know, we sort of saw her really make a shift. 
and we're gonna see that shift in two of her children. So that's one way that it sustains because we've, it, it's part of her culture now. But I think, um, the, I think the question the, had more to do with the grant and how right. long the so grant, this, does this woman get to stay in the program if the grant runs out? She's still, well actually she's working for my nonprofit now. Oh. <laughs> so we were able to transfer that to a job opportunity for her those skills that she received. The second sustainability piece is that because we're a nonprofit partner and we have work on the street, we do a produce stand every week at the health center. So that keeps our relationship alive. It's part of the work that we do um, and it will sustain beyond um, this funding. And so, our, and this funding was three years. So, uh so um, with East Street in Roxbury, we hope to sustain the program through what we call um, a medical fitness center. Um, this is um, a place where patients, as part of their annual physical, you know, the annual visits, they'll be given prescriptions to and refer to the medical fitness center where they receive life coaching and acupuncture or exercise and other things like that. So we hope to sustain the program through the medical fitness center. Our program is uh, going to be sustained through our partners because none of the, program, none of the um, activities that we provided were provided directly by us. They were provided by our partners. So the Kidney Foundation, um, the um, community health centers and the rest will continue. What we did was recruit them to come on to the campus and to provide those services. One of the health plans is providing the exercise services. So they have found benefit in that we can attract people to the campus to take part in those services. Whereas we had multiple resources within the community that people did not know about and without being able to coordinate that and bring it all together in one place, the community felt like it did not have those resources. But now they know about the resources. The resources are pleased with the fact that the program can attract people to it. Uh, and the, we have the commitment of our partner on the, uh, that ha owns the building to continue to allow those individual partners to come in and to uh, participate in, in bringing their program to, and because they get the funding for those programs, it makes them successful, and in turn, it makes the community successful, and it makes us successful. So we don't compete with them for um, dollars for that. Uh, all we need is really, is to be able to sustain the partnership and the collaboration and the newsletter communication that we send so, so are you saying, in effect, that if the Kresge grant runs out or diminishes, that you've built enough partnerships in the community and got them going that they can sustain the programs? They can sustain most of the aspects of the program. The part that may not be totally sustainable is that they like to have food at all of their events. <laughs> <laughs> so do we. <laughs> well, remember I, I used a quote from one of you when we first started about how you come into the community and, and you leave a few years later and you're left and people do this all the time. Does that, uh, does that model happen? Is, is that what's happening? Uh, yeah, <laughs> pass the mic down a little bit. Um, I'd just like to comment that because of the way that the funding was structured and because of the way that the project ended up kind of unfolding, is that um, you know, Kresge really charged us with engaging a couple of safety net institutions. And because we're scrappy safety net institutions, we really spent a lot of time um, working together and trying to fold it into things that were already happening or dovetailing on relationships that already existed. And because of that, I think the sustainability was a little bit more natural. So, um, you know, in just a couple of our cases, some of the strategies will be able to continue simply because the relationships that existed and because of the strategies that were identified to be um, working and that community members really engaged with. And for those reasons, 
different um, strategies will continue. So we did that with uh, a grocery store in West Oakland called Mandela Foods Cooperative. Um, part of our program was that the women were incentivized with coupons every month to, re to purchase the produce. And the grocery store allowed the, you know, the women to come in and they part, and in fact, not only the grocery store, but also corner stores in the community. Um, and the store owners would be very supportive of accepting these coupons. They would work with the women who were supposed to write down everything they bought to make sure that they were, you know, filling out their forms. Um, they were willing to accept these coupons and then wait sometimes two, three weeks before they got paid because they had to turn the coupon in, which then we had to write a check and, and pay them. So I think the business community, you know, we, we engaged, we were able to engage at least the, the retailers um, with the food aspect. Um, the other business community um, we did with field trips uh, where we took, one of the thing was uh, community. Women wanted more community activities. So we took them to um, the East Bay parks. We took them to a, like the boathouse and we did a gondola, not a gondola, a, like a boating ride and sang Christmas carols. We went to the farmer's market. So just engaging them in, in activities um, and businesses in their community was another way so now they knew they could access those resources on their own. In our program, in order for the women to qualify to enroll in the program, they had to be WIC recipients and or be receiving um, uh, prenatal care, CPSP. Um, I forget the first word in that, but it's prenatal services um, at, the, at the West Oakland Health Center. Uh, we have a business, the um Nortown Business Association uh, is a member of our impact um, community group. And so they've been involved in and will continue to be involved in the Greenway, maintaining the Greenway where our um, residents can walk uh, and they participate in a lot of our activities. In fact, our project manager is on the board of uh, the business coalition. Uh, we also engaged uh, the banks and the, um, we even engaged McDonald. Um, they gave out um, uh, coupons for salads and the kind of healthy eating piece alter alternatives that people could uh, get at McDonald's. So they participated with us as well and the local bank in the area has been involved. So. Uh, the one thing that we're in the process of doing now, and our, eva our internal evaluator happens to be here this morning, uh, is evaluating the change in um, the health status of the individuals who participated um, so that uh, we, um, we can see whether we've had an impact in reducing uh, weight and uh, impact in reducing their um, blood sugar levels as well as their hypertension. So, um, have you? Uh, we're in the process. Uh, we have a lot of data on engagement and how many activities people took uh, a part in. And so, we've gathered that data uh, and we have it in a database now that um, we're about to uh, mine that database. Uh, we've used it previously to tell us what we should be doing, um, the database to say what people um, were interested in. Um, based on whether they were business or whether they were individual um, in order to change our program. You would think that in order to reduce hypertension and reduce obesity, there are some general guidelines. Do you need data from eight different organizations to make the generalities that you need to make to, to make the lifestyle changes? Well, it depends on who you're talking to, who your audience is. Um, many of the health plans, they want to see um, hard coal data suggesting that there has been a decrease and you have to be able to track those individuals. There's so many intervening variables in order to 
because uh, this is a community, it's not a research project. And so uh, even when you talk to foundations and other funders, when they're looking for that data, they're looking for something that would require a, um, a um, experimental group and a control group. And you can never do that in a community because there are too many intervening factors that you can't control for. Right. We also had a credit union um, work with us. One of the things the women wanted was information about budgeting and managing money. So we had the credit union come in and do classes with the women and then offer them the opportunity to open accounts, of course, at the credit union for $5. So I think that that was uh, important too. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to ask a question or two about the evaluations. I mean, how do you know it, how you're doing? Do you need an outside evaluator? And is it sometimes more trouble than it's worth to gather all this data and, and so forth? Are evaluations a good thing or are they a hindrance? Well, I think they're a good thing. <laughs> um, I think that our, um, the way that the project ended up in unfolding was that we really prioritized evaluation from the beginning. So Hermosa Vida had an internal evaluator and then the Kresge Foundation also um, elected to get an external evaluator to look at the eight different sites and some commonalities because some of the things that they requested of us from the beginning were that we involve the safety net um, entities, that there was partnership, that there was community engagement, and that uh, community health center was involved. And um, so we were able to look at all of those. But in our case, we really looked at the ripple effect tool, which I mentioned before, and then also um, policy development and policy change that would have a, lot, a lasting impact and kind of move the needle for us. And so for those reasons, we were well uh, positioned to be able to collect information about our impact. Dana, how about you? Yeah, I think if you care about the impact of the work you do, you have to evaluate it. And what, what is important is to evaluate throughout the project, not just once in the beginning and once at the end. You sort of have to do it throughout. And so because Alameda County Public Health was the lead um, agency in, in our program, they had evaluators uh, working with us all through the project. Um, and having some feedback mechanism I think is important that if you're doing something that's not working, change it. <laughs> Don't keep doing that, you know. So I think that you have to have evaluation. And then Kresge also had their level of evaluation above that. It strikes me, and we were talking earlier about the clinics and the doctors and so forth, that if the doctors aren't doing their job and you go in there and you try to change that, personal relationship, that seems to be fraught with some problems. I mean, was the doctor going to say, yeah, I'm going to listen to these people? No. I mean, how, how does that work? How do you get them to change their MO, essentially? Well, it, they will change based on what their patients push them to do. So that's one of the ways you get them to change, by educating and getting the individual to take charge of their own health care, to understand what, it, what their uh, blood pressure reading means, and to get them to feel comfortable in asking their doctors what, um, what's going on and why am I feeling this way, and empowering them helps change the providers, and that's what our providers told us, is that they changed because their, um, their audience, their patients changed. Their patients pushed them to be better, and they really appreciate it. And how did you get them to push, to, to make that step? By, um, we had individual one-on-one -on -one, um, health days with individuals where we talked to them, we took their blood pressure, we um, did a, um, uh, we, did, we did their blood sugar with them, taught them how to, uh, uh, taught them about what their medications were, what they might be doing that was interfering with the medication, or maybe, uh, and we also put um, our pharmacists into the health center, and the, and they allowed us to come in in the um, waiting rooms to work with their patients, and um, 
we work with them to understand they might be providing too many medications. They have to begin to understand the person in the context of their environment in that maybe you could do 10 medications as opposed to 15. <laughs> and so by just giving them additional information about, well, if you prescribe uh, a cholesterol medication that costs $200, uh, this patient is not going to be able to afford it. Is there a substitute, a generic, that they could take that might do the same thing? Um, we feel that we found that health center providers are very interested in connecting with their um, patient population and making changes. Electronic medical records have also helped in that process. That's interesting. One of the things we haven't talked about, though I mentioned at the beginning, was the difficulty of getting men into these programs. And almost all of you have been talking most of the day about women. Is, is there a is this a, a, a problem, and is there a solution to it? Well, with our wellness program, the women began bringing families to the exercise programs. So eventually we saw babies, and then we saw the husbands and the uh, significant others coming. So it's really the women who will work to bring them in. Is this a problem, do you think? Yeah. Not having men involved, particularly? Yes, because they are equally affected with yeah, I would uh, think so. high blood pressure, diabetes, and things like that. So. One of the things that uh, our uh, project in Hawaii told us was about uh, a project they have where men get involved with a tool shop, and that's something that we have not been able to fund, so, but we're very interested in exploring because it um, is something that they're interested in uh, in terms of getting them involved in uh, repairing things uh, uh, for different uh, residents in the community. But the Hawaii project has been very successful in that area. When we did the focus groups at the beginning, we invited families to come, so even though for this pilot, the target was pregnant women. We did have husbands, boyfriends, whatever, come to the focus group and let us know what their issues were. And we invited them to any of the classes that we had. So we actually had one guy who went through the entire program with his girlfriend while she was pregnant. So, you know, that we had a little bit of that. But I think, in general, at least what I've seen in the food world, we mostly see you know, women involved with diet. Okay, well, I think, let me reintroduce our panel and uh, bring this to a close. A, a fascinating discussion. Uh, Amanda Guy from Flagstaff, Arizona. Dana Harvey from Alameda, California, Alameda County, California. Crystal Palmer from Roxbury in Boston. And Lucille Smith from Detroit. Thank you very much. Interesting comments. Very good.